Welcome to OPCC. Welcome to those of you joining online. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, if not, you can bring them next week. I think it's helpful to get down in there. Amen. Amen. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3. Full disclosure and honesty today, I feel fat and stiff. <laughs> it's achy, man. I don't know if it's the weather or what. Uh, so anyway, hopefully that I can get a little loosened up here, but I'm just don't, maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know, but uh, it, yeah, yeah, you just, you just be quiet. So here's a, some interesting things I've been thinking about. Like we're made in the image of God, right? So that as Christians, as people of faith who believe in the Bible, um, that we believe we are made in His image, and as part of that, that we are to be in relationship with Him. And so we're to walk in this uh, relationship with Him as He has restored our ability to be able to do that. But so many people struggle with intimacy with God. I think people even inside the church struggle with intimacy with the God, and that should not be the case. I mean, intimacy with God should, should just be a supernatural thing that happens in our lives based upon what the Lord has already done. And so I believe that the reason people struggle is that it's tied to worthiness. Um, and so what is worthiness? Worthiness is the quality of being good. And so I think that a lot of people feel unworthy. And in their minds, they think that to feel unworthy is a proper thing. And that's confusing, because if I say I am worthy, it feels prideful. And to say I'm unworthy feels humble, right? Like That's just kind of the way our language works. We think if somebody says I'm worthy, they're a prideful individual. And if they say I'm unworthy, um, then they're a humble person. But what we always find in the kingdom, theologically speaking, is what feels right side up is usually upside down. Jesus says the last will be first, and the first will be last. He says if you want to find your life, lose it. So always with Jesus in the kingdom, things are always flipped with what they seem um, right side up to you in your physical eyes looking at life. Um, when Jesus like adds truth to it, it's usually upside down. And I think this is the case when it comes to worthiness. And so in Zechariah's third vision, we learn a lot about worthiness. And so the first vision was the man among the myrtle trees, which showed that Jesus, would he went right down into the ditch. He was the man in the midst of the myrtle trees. The myrtle trees in chapter 1 um, was symbolic of Israel, and Jesus was the man, and all that was before them, he was saying, I'm going to be with you. Um, we learned about the craftsmen and how they would be used uh, to destroy the horns which is using the word as a hammer um, and destroying lies in your life and coming, the things that come against you. And then we learned about the surveyor and the city limits and how he measured the city of Jerusalem. And it was at, without limits. And, and Jesus and God said in this vision to Zechariah that, that we are the apple of his eye, which is the pupil of his eye, the most um, sensitive part that he protects so it's a very special place when we take all of these things. And when we get to Zechariah chapter 3, we learn a lot about worthiness. And what, what we find is that Satan's chief aim is to make you feel unworthy. <laughs> and so what he wants to do is constantly make you feel like an unworthy creature before God. And if you don't understand his modus operandi, then you will never accomplish divine intimacy with the creator of the universe. So this is very, very important and something the Lord is showing me recently. And I, I think you have to be careful with it because obviously there is something bad about being um, um, prideful and, and using language the wrong way. But as we look at this and as we unpack it, I think you will see what I'm trying to uh, teach you this morning. During the exile, meaning that Israel was punished for their disobedience, and so they were exiled to a foreign land, they were taken out of the nation that God had promised, or the land that God had promised to them, which is all about 
when we look at the first five books of the Bible and leading up through um, even the book of Joshua, it's about the, the taking of the land that was promised to uh, Abraham way back when. And so they're there. They have become a great nation. And because of their disobedience and not walking with God, they are exiled. They are punished. There are consequences for their sin. And when they are exiled, then all of the religious um, functions that they were accustomed to was taken away. And the priesthood was taken away. And so we learn that the first uh, nine uh, major or minor prophets were all pre-exile, and the last three are post-exile, meaning they are returning back to the land. And so Zechariah has been kind of helping them with that. We learned that in Haggai, man, he said, you're going to go back. I want you to get started on the temple. Quit focusing on your house. Focus on the temple, the Lord's house first, and then I'll take care of all of these other things. And so they're, they're trying to do those things, but one of the things that needed to be established was the priesthood. And so if you remember, there were three leaders that God um, appointed through the prophet Haggai as he, in his prophecy. They were uh, Zechariah, Zerubbabel, which was Zechariah was uh, the prophet. Zerubbabel was the governor, the leader, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and politically or civics. And then you have <clears throat> Joshua was the high priest. And so he was going to be a representative of the religious leadership. And so he had to be reinstalled as a high priest because they hadn't had a high priest in a long time that served in the priestly function that God had told them that he there that should be there. And so during this time of disobedience, what it created was an overwhelming sense of unworthiness. And so the people felt unworthy. Joshua is appointed high priest. They're wondering if they could trust him because all the priests before him were corrupt, which was part of the reason that they ended up getting exiled into Babylon in the first place. And so there was a lot of stuff going on within the nation of Israel that caused them to have this, uh, this, this low view of their worthiness. And so it created a lot of this, um, if you will, wrong thinking. And so in this third vision that God gives to Zechariah, he's correcting that. And it's fascinating to me as we study through these, these minor prophets in this Old Testament, because a lot of people, they want to avoid the Old Testament and think, well, we're living under the New Testament age. We might as well be turning to John chapter 3 today. Like, it is that strong. And so you'll see what I'm talking about as we unpack that the vision God gives through the prophet Zechariah to the nation of Israel. And you have to keep in mind, this is hundreds of years before Jesus is born. And so we start in verse 1, and it says uh, that, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. That's a very important statement. He says, listen, Joshua, everything that's happening is symbolic of things that are going to come. I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set in front of you, Joshua? There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. It's a pretty fascinating um, vision that God gives to Zechariah that has to do with the high priest um, Joshua. And the angel of the Lord that is speaking here, as, as, as we've established, 
This is none other than Christ himself. This is God. And often the angel of the Lord is used um, to describe that it is God. And so we see that there are, there are six truths in this text that help you think biblically about worthiness. And so my objective is today is that you understand and have a good theological framework for understanding what it means to be worthy and to be unworthy. And how you speak is how you think. And how you think is very important to your freedom in the kingdom. And so if you are thinking in a way that is, uh, that is, it is not true, then everything about you is going to be unhealthy in the kingdom. And you're never going to experience what Jesus promised. Um, like, it's so fascinating to me. As I, the longer I study the Bible, the more I'm just blown away by its depth. But we have in, in the Old Testament the promised land, and we have in the New Testament the promised life. And the promised land certainly was connected to the promised life, but the promised life under the dispensation of grace in the New Testament is absolutely incredible. And Jesus says, man, if you will listen to me, you have to understand, and it's a very similar passage in John chapter 10, we're dealing with a thief, and we're dealing with Jesus. And Jesus is the good shepherd, and there's a thief that steals, and Jesus comes to give the good life. Okay, and so these six um, things that I'm going to teach you about uh, that have to do with worthiness, I think are very, very important. And they won't take us very long to get through them. And here's the first one, and it comes from verse 1. Satan accuses everyone. Everybody. Like, just right out of the gate. You have to understand this. And rightly so, because everyone is guilty. The Scripture teaches us there is, um, there is none righteous, no, not one. The only person that was righteous was Jesus. Uh, the scripture teaches us that everyone sins and falls short of the glory of God. And so we know, even intrinsically, as we look at ourselves, that there is something messed up about us. And so Satan uses that to his advantage, and he accuses us. And Matthew Henry is a, a, um, an old, famous theologian, and uh, he wrote the following. And, and, and I can't really, like, rephrase it better, so I'm just going to read exactly what he said. Guilt and corruption are two great discouragements when we stand before God. By the guilt of the sins committed by us, we, come ob we become obnoxious to the justice of God. And by the power of the sin that dwells in us, we have become odious to the holiness of God. <laughs> Be encouraged. <laughs> it's like you are like when we think in terms of the sin. That, ha that, 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 that mars us, we are obnoxious to the justice of God and we are odious to the holiness of God. And so when we think in terms of the enemy accusing us, he stands on good grounds. And so here's the encouraging things. Okay, where's the encouraging stuff comes? Well, Joshua, the Greek... Um, uh, transliteration of the name Joshua is Yeshua. It's the same as Jesus, and it means the Lord saves. And so Joshua, like the Joshua in the time of Moses, was a type of Christ, um, just like Moses is a type of Christ. As you see all of this, these types and pictures of Christ throughout these Old Testament um, uh, characters that we study, but they obviously they weren't perfect as Christ was perfect, but they are a picture of what he is going to do. And so in this, we see that the Lord serves. And so that brings us, or saves, and that brings us to our second principle that I want you to understand. Is the chosen stand excused, not accused? This is very important. If you look at verse 2, so we see verse 1, that the, the, that the enemy stood at the right side of Joshua to accuse him before God. That's a strong picture. Satan himself, the accuser, and, then, and Satan as, as, as a name is not more developed until the New Testament, but we see that all theologians agree that this is the picture being painted here through the prophet Zechariah, is that we have the enemy of God standing at the right hand of Joshua and accusing him before God. But then it goes on in verse 2, and it says, The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has, what, chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? You may be right. There are things messed up about Joshua. 
But don't forget, this man has been plucked out of that. I have chosen him. And so for the saint, the judge is his friend, and that's good news. It's good news, man. You think about, okay, Joel got his first ticket. Where's Joel? He's like, why are you talking about me? And Joel has to go to court, and so he wants to just pay the ticket. I said, no, you got to go to court, man, because they might, they might like give you a chance to go on probation and take this off your record and keep your insurance payment as such that I'll keep you on my policy. Otherwise, you're done, right? And so I said, you got to go to court, and you got to go before the judge. Now, how great would it be if he showed up? When do you got to go, Joel, this week? Oh, good. All right. Wouldn't it be great tomorrow if you walked in the court there at Overland Park or wherever you got to go, and you opened up the doors and you went back and you, when you saw and you walked in the courtroom, you saw the guy sitting on the bench and it was Jason Lynch, right? You'd be like, I know him. And immediately you would know, I may be guilty, but this guy knows my dad really good. He knows me. I've done some work for him and probably he's going to excuse me. And if he doesn't, I'm going to tell my dad, and my dad's not going to lie. You're on your mind, it starts racing. Well, that's kind of the picture here, man, that is going on, is that the saint who has been chosen by God, the judge is his friend. And so notice the Lord rebukes Satan. Why? Because the Lord chose Jerusalem. Now, what, it's, what this tells us is it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. It's about who you know that puts you in a position that where you are walking with God as your friend. And I'm reminded of a time when Jesus, he, is, he tells them, you know, who do you say that I am? He's talking to his disciples, the, the apostles themselves. And he said, who do you think that I am? And they said, well, some people say you're this or some people say you're that. And he said, yeah, but who do you think I am? And Peter, man, he he gets up some courage and he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, you're right, man. This didn't come to you from flesh and blood. This was revealed to you from heaven. And Peter is feeling good, man. He's like, one for me. Like, look what I did, bros. And so then Jesus proceeds to tell them that he is going to die. And Peter's like, no, I forbid it, Lord. And what does Jesus say to him right after telling him he just received this information from heaven? He looks at Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. Right, And so there's a very powerful moment of truth. And then uh, Peter starts to think about the things of the world instead of the things of God. And so Jesus recognizes this is, this is Satan trying to manipulate him and, and, and get him to go a different direction. And he tells him to get behind him. And so what is encouraging for me is that when the Lord chooses, okay, when the Lord chooses a person, as he chose Jerusalem, Satan's location is moved. To stand at the right hand of someone, the prosecutor, I believe, is always on the right side of the person he's accusing in a courtroom. To stand on the right per side of a person is to stand in a place of opposition. But when Jesus says to Satan, get behind me, and he rebukes him here as he rebuked him in the, this particular occasion, and we could look at also how he, the Satan tries to come against him early on in his ministry, and we would see that the location of Satan has changed. He no longer stands at the right side of Joshua, but he has now moved behind. Behind Jesus, and Jesus is functioning as a mediator for Joshua. And so the location of the enemy is changed, and therefore the chosen stand excused, not accused. So I'm reminded also of, first, or, uh, of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. What does it teach us? In him we were also chosen. I'm reminded of Jesus saying, no one can come to the Father unless the Father, what, draws him unto himself. And so in the sovereignty of God, one cannot become a, a Christian unless God chooses him. Now, in the midst of the sovereignty of God, we have this idea of the free will of man that is clearly taught in Scripture. And how you reconcile those two things, I'm just not clearly sure how you do that. There are people smarter than me that are thousands of years that have been talking and writing and debating about that. But I can tell you one thing that I see clearly in Scripture. Man has free will and God is sovereign. And he gives, as he makes a choice of us, we have a choice to be able, I think it is all about surrendering the free will that he has given us in 
in the image that we are created in his image. As he makes a choice of us, I can choose to surrender and say, I want, I'm, I'm thankful that you have chosen me. I, I, I want to be yours. I'm giving you myself. I'm giving you my free will, and now I'm going to function under your will for my life. And so when that happens, the chosen person is excused, not excused. Now, this begins to build. So this is very important for your thinking and your understanding of how you're going to live in a place of victory this year. Here's the third thing. Chosen people go from filthy to festive. Look at verses 3 through 5. He says, Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The word filthy is the Hebrew word soyam, and it is the strongest expression in Hebrew for filth. It literally means excrement and vomit. He stood before the Lord, and this was all over his clothes. It's one thing to have it on your body and wash it off. When that stuff gets on your clothes, it sours, it is nasty, and the longer it is there, the more foul you are to the people around you. Okay? And so here's what he's saying. He's painting a picture of Joshua who's being accused by the enemy that is foul before the Lord. And this is important because this totally disqualified one for a priestly function. Like the priest had to make sure that he went through all of the rites of purification before he could perform his priestly duty. So he had to be ceremonially clean. That's why there were, there's so much talk in the Bible in um, uh, the Mosaic law about uh, being clean and unclean is that a priest needed to be clean in order to do the priestly functions that he was asked to do within the temple that God had prescribed for them to do. And so this totally disqualified one for being able to do it. As a matter of fact, there was a certain period and very many, a lot of different things that one had to do in order to be restored to a position of cleanness if they even were touched by some vomit or anything else filthy, okay? And so here, here's the thing. In this situation, God acts both negatively and positively. What does he do first? It says that first... He says, take off his filthy clothes. That's the negative part. Strip him down to nothing but nakedness in all of his shame. Take him back to the place he was where I created him before the first man and woman tried to cover their shame with fig leaves. Strip him down to that place. And that's the negative thing. Take off the sin. And then what is the positive thing? clothe him with rich garments. What did God do in Genesis? He sacrificed the animal and he made uh, uh, clothes from skins and he clothed them. It's always a picture of what God is going to do in the realm of the kingdom. How he's making a, a choice of people and he's, he's basically restoring them. And so he goes from filthy to festive garments. He's purged, he's clothed, and he's crowned. They also put the turban on his head. And so here's the thing, is that the first appearance of Joshua, the first time we see them, him in this vision, it shows how he appears before men. And the good news is, is the second time it shows how he appears before God. And so he is chosen, and now God looks at him, and he has rich, costly garments on. And, and so this, this, this tells us that people really are as they are with God, not as they appear to others. You really are, regardless of what you think, when you boil it right down and you get pushed back in a corner with a message of truth like this right now, and it's just you and God, that's what you really are. It doesn't matter what I think you are. It doesn't matter that if you've got me in a position where you think that I think you're safe. It doesn't matter that if you've got, um, you know, uh, Shay or Molly or, or, or Corey or Sean or anybody, people in your family, your own husband, your wife could think that you are one thing, but you really are as you are with God. And that's the picture being painted here, is that the only way to, for you to be in a place of worthiness is for God to do a work in your life. And so here's the thing, is that Christ loathes our filthy garments. Like, like the, the scripture couldn't be more plain is that we are enemies of God when we are left in our sin. And so here's what he does. He does not put us away. He puts them away. 
And so he reconciles himself to the sinner, not the sin. So here's the guy in all of his filthiness, and God says, in the negative, take away all of that sin. In the positive, clothe him um, with all of my um, righteousness. And so we go on, and we see that, first of all, Satan accuses everyone. Second, the chosen stand excused, not accused, and chosen people go from filthy to festive. Now, the, th- the, the fourth one is this. Chosen people are charged with kingdom responsibility. Look at verse 6. It says, The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. He's in the throne room of God. And he says, if you do these things, then I will give you a position much like all of these people around me, which is a position of authority. When our, so, so, so chosen people in that moment we, that we are chosen, we are charged with kingdom responsibility. When our sins are put away, they're, in the negative, they're taken away. We are clothed with priestly garments, and therefore we serve in a priestly function. This is called the priesthood of the believer. Second Peter, Peter, the apostle Peter recognized it clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Listen to what he says. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. What? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You might as well say, once you had filthy garments on, now you have clean garments on. Once you were not clothed in righteousness, now you are clothed in righteousness. That's what Peter is saying. And he's saying because of that, you are now experiencing what is known as in the New Testament, the priesthood of the believer. And so as Joshua is symbolic of all things that are going to come, that it's symbolic of the priesthood that is going to come to the believer like you and me. Now, unfortunately, in the modern age that we live in, in the church, we have professionalized the priesthood. And the priesthood has been reserved for those who are on paid staff at a church. And the, and the people have been taught that what you need to do is come and make sure that you give enough and you serve enough that we can have a ministry where the priesthood can continue to be elevated and they can continue to charge you up. And it's close, but not, it's not exactly right. Because what happens is, is the priest becomes fatter and fatter spiritually, and the sheep suffer. And it's exactly what um, uh, Ezekiel prophesied against, is that the sheep are becoming lean while the shepherd gets fat. And so what is supposed to happen is the shepherd is supposed to understand everything that I'm teaching, and he's supposed to teach the sheep that you are a priest of God. I'm not the only priest of God. That's why we call me a pastor and not a priest. We are all priests of God. Uh, that, that's just what the Bible teaches. And so when, when we look at this, we are ministers of the gospel. And our sins are either put away or we are put away from the priesthood. So when your sins are put away, you are installed into the priesthood. And if your sins have not been put away, then you could never be a priest of God. That's what this is teaching. If our sins have been put away and we still feel unworthy, we will not fulfill our kingdom responsibility because we believe we are unfit. And there are too many people who are saying, I could never do that. I'm unfit for that. They're believing the wrong thing. You see, and that's what we see as we continue to trace this down. I'll show you in the next two takeaways is that it is wrong thinking and we should avoid it at all costs. And the reason that we should avoid thinking that we are unfit at all costs is because this teaches us in verses 8 and 9 that sin was removed in a single day. Like, look at verse 8 and 9. It says, Listen, O high priest Joshua and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant the branch. That's when Jesus shows up, okay? See the stone, what was Jesus called? A stumbling block, the chief cornerstone. The stone I have set in front of you, Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. Seven is always a number of completeness. 
okay? And so it's like God sees everything. It's perfect in all of its beauty. And he says, and I will remove sin, the sin of this land in a single day. And so we know that that is a foreshadowing of the atonement of Christ on the cross of Calvary. In a single day when Jesus said, to tell us die, it is finished. It was over. And sin was removed um, from the land. And so your sins must be removed. And you cannot do it. This, this seems so simple, but it's so important. Because we have too many people trying to get themselves fit for service in the kingdom that can never get themselves fit for service in the kingdom because they're all done in one single day. And that is the day of atonement on the cross of Calvary when Jesus died and he says, it is finished. Then sin was taken away in that single moment. And so effort gets you nowhere with God. You must allow God to do it. And that's why we call it atonement. He is atoning for our sins. And that brings us to the last takeaway before we get to the idea, big idea. Chosen people, this is really encouraging, chosen people have their own place of prosperity. So he ends with, in that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Well, what do we know about the vine and fig tree? It's always a place of comfort, and it's always indicative of a, a, a statement of prosperity. It's always a fruitful experience. You remember when we were studying, um, uh, I think it was um, Amos, and he said, when I saw Israel, it was like seeing a fig tree from afar. Okay? Uh, uh, Jonah, when he was discouraged, and what did he have grow up after, after he was frustrated by what God was doing? A vine to bring him comfort. And so he says, each man and each person will sit under his vine and his fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. This means that we function as priests of God for the gospel, and when we function in our God-given right, we prosper. Okay, so we are allowed not only to prosper, we are given authority. So we go back up and he says in um, uh, uh, verse six or seven, this is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house. That's a position of power and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. What did Jesus say? You were my witnesses, go ye therefore and make disciples. All power on heaven and earth has been given to me, and I give it to you. Go ye therefore and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As what? A priest of God. And so all of this we see that he is giving us a position of prosperity from which to function. And discipleship works from this fig tree as what? The fig tree is connected to the branch that we find in John chapter 15. I am the vine. Like, and he, like he is the branch. And as we connect to him, then we prosper as we abide in him and we rest in him and we draw our power from him. We understand our position comes from him. Then we realize that he puts us in a place and a, a position of power and authority, okay? So that's how discipleship works. And so everyone is a priest of God. Everyone is to be making and sharing. So what we do is he says, not only does everyone have his vine and fig tree, what can he do in the vine and fig tree? He can invite other people to come sit under it with him. And what does we do in discipleship? We invite people to come sit in our position of prosperity so that we can expose them to the gospel, the truth of the word of God, and they too can learn about this king that takes away the filthy garments and puts on these wonderful costly precious garments and they too can come to a place where they have their own vine and fig tree and they can begin to invite people into it as well okay and so that's what the kingdom is about is advancing through people inviting other people into their lives sharing the truth of God with them being priests and ministers of the gospel and the gospel taking and spreading like fire and that's how we end up with the church covering the entire globe okay so this is what the Lord expects out of us and so here's here's the big idea Humble people realize they are worthy, and prideful people think they are not. So every time you're tempted to say that I'm unworthy, I can't do that, you know that you're looking in the face of God if you are a chosen person, and your heart is filled with pride. 
And it is a sin that he describes in the Bible that says he hates. Now, that's a different way to think about the worthiness. Now, we're not going around and saying, I'm worthy of this, I'm worthy of that. That's not what I'm saying. Because see, a humble person, humble person realizes, I can't do anything to get in this position, but let God put me there. A prideful person says, God can't put me there. And that's why a humble person realizes, they realize they are worthy because of the work that God has completed in their lives. And they receive it and they accept it. And then they start doing the requirements that are asked of them. They start walking in his ways. They start walking in his power. They start walking in his authority. And as priests of of God, ministers of the gospel, they start ministering to other people. And they realize if they're not ministering to other people, they are not. Walking in obedience to the Lord. Now this is important. If you think you are unworthy before the Lord, you are, a, you are listening to the accuser, not the Savior who removed sin in a single day. So you're listening to the, a liar. If you listen to the accuser, you will always feel unworthy which is prideful because you are saying, God cannot use me. And Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. They hear me, and they walk out their obedience. (laughs) So church, if you are among the chosen, you are worthy to fulfill your duty as a minister of the gospel. And you should just start telling yourself every day, I'm a minister of the gospel. You don't just have a minister of the gospel that's your pastor. You are a minister of the gospel. We're all ministers of the gospel. And so how are we fit for that? He made us fit. He took off our filth and he put righteousness on us. And he said, go and declare the praises of what I've done in your life. And be a priest of God to those around you. So you, my friend, are worthy. Now, the Lord hit me with this this morning. I didn't even see this part until I was sitting there worshiping this morning. And we're taking communion today. And for the first time, it really makes sense to me. As we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he says of communion, he said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was baptized, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay? So you proclaim what I did in a single day until I come back. And then he says this. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So ever like does it and they, they start to think that they're unworthy because they don't realize of the position that they're in. They're not walking that out. I, I, would, I would even say to you it would be unworthy to partake of communion if you keep saying, I'm not fit to serve in the kingdom. Then don't drink the juice today. Don't eat the bread. Because when you do that, you do it in remembrance of the single day that he took all the filth out of your life and said, you are fit to be a minister of the gospel. And so when you drink the juice and you eat the bread, You let it remind you that you are in good standing with the Lord. He has taken off the filth and he has clothed you in righteousness. And you are a minister of the gospel. And friends, that is good news. And so this year as you look out there and you think about all that is ahead of you, don't forget the most important thing if you are among the chosen. You are a priest or priestess of God. Let us pray over the elements and receive the communion today. And maybe maybe the first step for you is a time of repentance before you partake and just to repent of their thinking. If you've been thinking the wrong way about this, then just repent. 
before you partake of the elements today. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Lord, for being able to unpack it and it penetrate our hearts and encourage us. I can just encourage us, Lord, with what you have done and to realize that our standing is all because of the work that you have done and now we are fit to walk in the power and authority that you've given us and that we don't have to act like filthy people because we are not filthy people. We can walk in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. So as we partake of the vine today, let, us remind, let it remind us that we are connected to the branch. As we partake of the bread today, let, us rem- let it remind us, Lord, that your body was broken. And in a single day, you made a way for sin to be removed. And Lord, let it remind us that we are worthy to be priests of God because that's the work you've done in our lives. We love you. We thank you, and we pray these things in Christ's name, and amen.